Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'd like today to uh, present uh, one of the lectures which will be very important, uh, which is the novel oral anticoagulation. It will be apart from the uh, Cardiogo lecture series, which will also will be apart from educational program of Cardiogo, which will be con uh, consisting two parts. The first part will be the continuous medical education waves, and the second part will be the Cardiogo lecture series. We will start today with a very important lectures for the novel oral anticoagulant uh, and I think we have a very important data which we will present today uh, in uh, this topic and at the end of 2018 and at the start of 2019. Uh, I'd like you first to know the common pathway of action of the novel oral anticoagulant which will act uh, on the factor 10 activated to prevent the uh, prothrombin from transforming to thrombin and uh, then the thrombin will also be prevented from transferring the fibrinogen to fibrin and it will prevent the clot. There is another separate pathway for one of the novel oral anticoagulant which is dabigatran which will preventing directly transformation of prothrombin to thrombin and it will block the cascade of clotting uh, by blocking directly the transformation of prothrombin to thrombin. Uh, what is the approved indication? The approved indication, we have a wide range of indications for these very important drugs. The VTE prevention, this come on the top of the list of the indications. The stroke and systemic embolization prevention in non-valvular AF, and it's also a very important indication. And the treatment and the prevention for recurrence of DVT, treatment and the prevention of recurrence of pulmonary embolism. The stroke prevention post-PCI with concomitant atrial fibrillation, which, is, which we will have a new evidence regarding this indication. Secondary prevention of atherosthrombotic events post ACS without AF also and the secondary prevention of atherosthrombotic events in stable coronary artery disease without atrial fibrillation. Uh, I will show you here the advantages, the advantages of the new oral anticoagulant over vitamin K antagonists for thromboembolic prevention in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Actually, there is uh, advantages for those drugs over the uh, conventional vitamin K antagonists, which, is, which are predictable effects without need for monitoring. It's also very important. Fewer food and the drug interactions, we can find these interactions uh, uh, very clearly with the uh, vitamin K antagonists. And the uh, more predictable half-life and elimination, it's also important, and the improved efficacy and safety ratio. If we shift to the origin of stroke in the atrial fibrillation, the loss of organized atrial contraction leads to reduced cardiac output and stasis, induced thrombus formation, most often in the left atrium, also in the left atrial appendage. The thrombotic material in the left atrium and the left atrial appendage may implies to any part of the body, especially the brain and the extremities, and leading to stroke if it is in, if it is embolizing to the brain and leading to the acute occlusion of the peripheral arteries if it is embolized in the uh, uh, peripheries. Emboli originating from the left atrium can result in ischemic stroke and systemic arterial occlusion, as I said. Okay. Uh, also, if we have to say about the uh, AF stroke are severe strokes. The AF uh, strokes are severe, much more severe than the strokes for any other reason. It is 20% fatal, it is 60% disabling, and I think it is disastrous for those strokes resulting from an AF origin. And another important statement is people with atrial fibrillation are five more likely to have stroke than those without atrial fibrillation and, do, and for that reason it, they are at very high risk for developing a stroke. The number of patients with atrial fibrillation is anticipated to continue to increase. If you look at this slide, uh, all th uh, through the years starting from 1919 uh, up to 2015 we can see that 
in the Olmsted County data and uh, that in 2095, for example, uh, it was 2.08, it will reach in 2015 506 million patients with atrial fibrillation. And I think this is a very big number which will increase through years and it will still increase through years for those patients with atrial fibrillation worldwide. The narrow therapeutic window of the vitamin K antagonist is another challenging point for those drugs which necessitates monitoring to stay within range because there is a therapeutic range which we have to be kept inside and I think because of this narrow window with vitamin K antagonists we have a challenge to adjust the, those, the bleeding profile and the thrombotic profile for those patients and we are also at a great challenge for preventing bleeding events and thrombotic events because it is a narrow range the INR should be between 2 and 3 uh, I'd like you to know also a very important study which is the rocket atrial fibrillation which will it shows uh, here an effective stroke prevention in patient with non-valvular atrial fibrillation versus warfarin this study was done for rivaroxaban versus warfarin and it shows an effective stroke prevention for those patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation not only that but also significant reduction in critical organ and in intracerebral hemorrhage and fatal bleeding versus uh, warfarin if we look here to the latest guidelines, which is the European Society of Cardiology guideline 2016, we can see here that there is n the novel oral anticoagulant are preferred for stroke prevention for patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Uh, it is stated that the high-risk patient with Schatz VASC score more than two, the novel oral anticoagulation are preferred. Uh, there is a very important slide also which is recently published it is the Xanthus, a real world prospective observation study for patients treated with rivaroxaban for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation and this study stated that in total of about 7,000 patients did not experience any of the outcomes of treatment emergent all cause this major bleeding or stroke also the major bleeding uh, occurred in 1.9 percent of patients mostly treated using the conservative methods the persistence with rivaroxaban in xanthus was 80 percent at one year the over 75 percent of patients was very satisfied with their treatment okay this slide also is one of the most practical and informative slide for the suggested structures, uh, structured follow-up. The initiator of anticoagulant treatment sets indication for anticoagulation, make choice of anticoagulation, decides on need of proton pump inhibitor or rat. The baseline hemoglobin, renal and driver function is also important. The, we have to provide education for those patients who will take the anticoagulations, the hands out anticoagulation cord for follow up is also a critical uh, uh, issue. Organizes follow up when, by whom, and what will be the uh, pathway for the follow up. Uh, uh, who will remain a responsible coordinator for follow up? Those are very important points w uh, for the structured uh, follow up. Uh, the first follow-up is supposed to be after one month. It can be done by the general practitioner in anticoagulation clinic uh, or the initiator of the therapy, whatever the general practitioner or the, uh, the uh, cardiologist or in the internist. Uh, the, the checkup contained the compliance of the patient and that for that reason the patient should bring with him the remaining bills to count them and to be sure that the patient uh, is uh, uh, taking the medication regularly the thromboembolic events if it happened 
bleeding events also if it happened other side effects the coma medication and over the counter medications which are expected to over to uh, uh, interact the need for blood sampling uh, also is a very important point in case of problems uh, contacts in shape of treatment uh, this is are the structured uh, follow-up for the patient who will be on anticoagulation okay in this slide we can see the checklist during follow-up of atrial fibrillation patients on NOAX I'd like here to highlight one of those points which is the blood sampling the blood sampling should be yearly as regards the hemoglobin renal or liver function for those not having a, the, a, a problems mandating to do those uh, investigations and six monthly of those patients with renal function with creatinine clearance from 30 to 60 or if on dabigatran and aged more than 75 years or fragile those patients will need more closed monitoring for blood sampling every six months we make we will make it more close three months if the creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30 uh, 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 millimeter per minute okay how to measure the anticoagulant effect of NOAX the routine monitoring of, 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 of coagulation not required for those patients under a novel oral anticoagulant but quantitative assessment of drug exposure sometimes needed in emergency situation and what those situation that we will be in need for doing or measuring the anticoagulant effect of NOAX if there is a serious bleeding and the thrombotic events if there will be an urgent surgery if there is a renal or hepatic insufficiency for those patients with potential drug-drug interaction and suspected overdosing. The action to be taken in those patients with drug-drug interactions. The drug-drug interactions, there, is a, there, there will be a three levels of alert. The red, which will be a contraindication or not recommended to take this drug or the novel oral anticoagulant the other the other color code is the orange which will adapt the dose of NOAC accordingly for example the bigatran if i have an orange code the bigatran will be will be from reduced from 150 milligram to 110 milligram did and the rivaroxaban will be reduced from 20 to 15 milligram every day and aroxaban will be shifted from 5 to 2.5 milligram BID if I have an orange code for drug-drug interaction. What about the yellow code? The yellow code, we will consider the dose reduction if two concomitant yellow codes present or interaction present. If I have to have two yellow codes for reducing the dose, but if I have only one yellow code for drug-drug interaction, there will be no action taken and the dose will be kept on the same regimen. Uh, here the color coding as I said the possible drug drug interaction the effect on NOAC plasma level uh, uh, for uh, the drug drug interaction and the most prominent here is those with uh, antifungal treatment the ketoconazole, itraconazole, elvoriconazole and bosaconazole those antifungal drugs are taking the read code which is totally contraindication to give them with the uh, 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 with the novel uh, or with the novel oral anticoagulation there is a yellow code for kinidine with dabigatran and rivaroxaban and there is an orange code with for verapamil with edoxaban so with edoxaban there is, will be a reduction of those if it will be used concomitantly with verapamil Another possible drug-drug interaction is those for patients taking rifampicin, phenytoin, or phenoparpital. For dabigatran and abixaban, it takes the uh, red coat. And for edoxaban and rivaroxaban, it takes the yellow coat. It is important to know which drug, when will it interact with the NOAC, 
it will take the red code, yellow code, orange code to adjust the dose. So those cards for drug-drug interaction, I think it should be kept under our eyes when we are prescribing the NOAC to avoid overdose or to avoid the harmful drug-drug interaction. Another, another very critical and very practical point, which is how to switch between anticoagulant regimen. Suppose that this patient is under vitamin K antagonist and we would like to shift this patient to NOAC. We have to consider the INR for these patients. If the INR of this patient who was on vitamin K antagonist, and I'd like to shift him to NOAC, if the INR is less than two, we can do this switch immediately. If the INR is between two and 2.5, we can do it immediately or in the next day. But if the INR for those patients under vitamin K antagonist is above 2.5, I have to wait until the, the half-life of the vitamin K and to estimate the time of the INR till it reach the two point, less than 2.5 and initiating the vitamin, uh, the NOAC. What about the parenteral anticoagulation to NOAC? If this patient is kept on parenteral anticoagulation for an reason or another, intravenous, either intravenous unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. We have to start once the unfractionated heparin discontinued, the half-life is two hours, maybe longer in patient with renal impairment, we can consider that. And for those with low molecular weight heparin, we will start initiation of the NOAC when the next dose have to be given. Support we will give the uh, 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 Kilexan 8, a very important practical point is the switch between the anticoagulant regimens. First, is the change between our switch between the vitamin K antagonist to NOAC. We have to consider here the INR. If the INR is below 2, we can shift or switch from vitamin K antagonist to NOAC immediately. If the INR from 2 to 2.5, we can do it immediately or the next day accordingly. If the INR is 2.5, more than 2.5, we have to use the INR and vitamin K antagonist first half lifetime to estimate the time to INR less than 2.5 and then we initiate the uh, uh, NOAC. What about the uh, changing or switching from NOAC to vitamin K antagonist? We have to administer concomitantly the until the INR in appropriate range. So we have to give the vitamin K antagonist concomitantly with the NOAC till we reaching the therapeutic uh, 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 range of the INR. Measure the INR just before next intake of NOAC. Restart or retest 24 hours after the last dose of NOAC and we have to monitor the INR in the first month until a stable values which is between 2 and 3 achieved. In compliance, what about the compliance with NOAC? It is important to know that the anticoagulation effect of NOAC drops rapidly after 12 to 24 hours. So, the once daily is better adherence than the BID regimen for cardiovascular drugs in general, but no data on superior dosing scheme for NOAC in clinical practice. So the patient education is very crucial because they have to know that they will be at risk if they are delaying the dose because the anticoagulant effect drops uh, 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 rapid between 12 and 24 uh, hours. And I think also involvement of the family member will be also important for educating uh, uh, them how to use those drugs and uh, 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 how to stop, how to continue if missed doses. And this is, an, I think, an important slide describing what I said, how to deal with the dosing error. 
The dosing error if we have a missed dose. For those drugs, Nuax, which with BID regimen, takes the missed dose up to six hours after the scheduled intake. If not possible, skip dose and take the next scheduled dose. What about for those once daily, taken once daily, take the missed dose up to 12 hours. If not available, you can uh, take it in the next scheduled dose. What if there is a double dose? If the double dose for those uh, uh, drugs which taken BID, skip next planned dose and restart the BID after 24 hours. For those taken once daily, continue the normal regimen. I think this is also practical point which is important. Here, uh, a practical recommendation for the dosing in chronic kidney disease. I think there is also a data here which is uh, uh, practically important for those patients, for example, under dabigatran or who will take dabigatran for creatinine clearance from 30 to 49, 150 milligram is possible, but 100 milligram BID if high risk of bleeding is recommended. We have a note here that 75 milligram BID is only approved in the United States of America, and if creatinine clearance from 15 to 13, or if creatinine clearance from 30 to 40, 49, and or, uh, orange factor like verabamil, as I said in the coding, for drug-drug interaction. What about the rivaroxaban? The rivaroxaban, it is 15 milligram once daily when the creatinine clearance reach between 15 to 49. We have to reduce the dose from 20 to 50 uh, milligram. So there is a dose uh, a modification if there is a, a, a renal dysfunction and I am always said in my lectures uh, that uh, uh, we have to know the creatinine clearance and the EGFR it is not the matter of creatinine only we, we all have a smartphones and we all uh, can uh, calculate the EGFR by putting for example the creatinine the age the weight the height it we have I will have and by uh, the estimated EGFR and so I can adjust the dose of my drugs by knowing the e EGFR Uh, what to do if there is an overdose without bleeding or a clotting test is indicated at risk of bleeding? If there is an overdose, acute recent ingestion of overdose, we can give activated charcoal to reduce the absorption in a dose of about 30 to 50 gram. We will consider coagulation tests to assess the possible bleeding risk. In absence of bleeding, we can wait and see approach. We will use wait and see approach. Don't rush. If there is no, if there is no bleeding, we can use the wait and see uh, approach. Another also important practical point, the patients undergo a planned surgical intervention or ablation. Classification of surgical intervention according to the bleeding risk. There is a very common question. Uh, ask it by uh, uh, the patient, I will go to extract my uh, teeth and I'd like the doctor, the dentist asked me to stop or not my anticoagulation or antithrombotic. A very frequent and a very common question we ask it in, every, in our everyday practice. I would like to clarify uh, uh, this uh, uh, important practical point here in this slide. Intervention not necessarily require discontinuation of anticoagulation, but we can perform the procedure at the thorough levels of NOAC, consider scheduling intervention 18 to 24 hours after the last intake, and then restart six hours later. The dental intervention, extraction of one up to two, three teeth, paradental surgery, incision of an abscess, implant positioning. These are a list of dental intervention which not necessarily requiring discontinuing the anticoagulation and putting the patient under risk of thromboembolization, of unwanted discontinuation of the drug. So at this list of indication we see here, 
we can we 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 we, can, we are allowed not to stop the uh, uh, anticoagulation. Also, in some of the ophthalmology procedures like cataract or glaucoma interventions, also there is no need to stop the anticoagulation, and we can interact with the ophthalmologist and informing him that you can do your cataract procedure, your glaucoma procedure intervention without discontinuation, the anticoagulation and putting the patient for the risk with uh, uh, no need. Also endoscopy without surgery, also we can continue uh, uh, the anticoagulation and no need to stop it. The superficial surgery like the abscess incision or small dermatological excision, those interventions also no need to stop the uh, anticoagulation. This is a very important practical point because sometimes we put the patient at risk of thromboembolization for fear of the bleeding risk which is not also present, which is not actually present. So I think we have to know this list of, uh, uh, of uh, drugs or uh, for procedures, sorry, uh, which we have not necessarily uh, need to stop it. What about the classification of surgical intervention according to the bleeding risk? Those patients with low bleeding risk, the endoscopy with biopsy, prostate or bladder biopsy, electrophysiological study or radiofrequency catheter ablations for supraventricular tachycardia for example, and geography, pacemakers, those are low, low risk. What about those at high risk of bleeding? If there is complex left-sided ablation, spinal or epidural anesthesia, thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery, major orthopedic surgery, liver biopsy, transmural prostate resection, and kidney biopsy. It's very important to know why. Because by knowing the bleeding risk, you will take the decision if you will stop or continue your anticoagulation. For example, here, when to stop NOAX before a planned surgical intervention. For those patients also, it is adjusted according to the risk of the procedure of bleeding and the creatinine clearance. We can again here clarify the importance of calculating the creatinine clearance and the EGFR. For example, for uh, rivaroxaban, for those patients with creatinine clearance of 50 to 80, for those patients with low risk of bleeding, we will discontinue 24 hours before. For those with high risk, we have to discontinue for the last uh, 48 hours. So it is important to know the risk of bleeding and the creatinine clearance to know when to stop. Another practical point is when to restart NOAC after a planned surgical intervention. We will ask, be asked by the anesthesiologist and the surgeon when we will be able to restart the uh, uh, NOAC. Procedure with immediate and complete hemostasis, a traumatic spinal and epidural anesthesia, clean lumbar puncture, we can resume the anticoagulation from six to eight hours after surgery. This is an important practical uh, point. Here is uh, the recommendation for stopping and starting knock after AF ablation procedure. The recommended strategy of bridging and restarting of NOAC, a too aggressively shortened pre-procedural cessation of NOAC and or no bridging may be less safe when compared to continue vitamin K antagonist administration and ablation under an INR between two to three, both concerning bleeding and cardioembolic complications. What if this patient or if a patient underwent uh, uh, or will undergo an urgent surgical intervention. We have to discontinue the NOAC. We have tried to refer surgery at least 12 hours and ideally 24 hours after the last dose. And we have the urgent surgery associated with much higher rates of bleeding than elective procedure, but lower than vitamin K antagonist treated uh, uh, patients. Sometimes the coagulation test can be considered for those patients under uh, NOAC to uh, uh, monitor and to see uh, the coagulation effect or anticoagulation effect for the NOAC. Uh, for the, uh, the recent data, as I said, we are fortunately have 
in 2018 the European Heart Rhythm Association practical guide on the use of non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. What are the selected indications for those patients with mechanical prothetic valves contraindicated? For moderate to severe mitral stenosis also contraindicated. For those with mild to moderate other native valvular diseases like mild to moderate aortic stenosis included in the NWAC trial. For severe aortic stenosis there is a limited data most will undergo intervention, especially on those excluded in the RELY uh, trial. A piprothesis valve after three months is postoperatively. It is not advised if it is those with rheumatic origin. It can be accepted if or degenerative mitral regurgitation or in the aortic uh, position. Here is the calculation of the child puff score and the use of NWAC in hepatic insufficiency. Another practical challenging situation for those patients with hepatopathy and we need to give them a novel oral anticoagulation. We have to calculate the child puff score for those patients before deciding to give them the novel anticoagulation. For those patients with a child A from five to six points, we have no dose adjustment for the dabigatran, abixaban, iduxaban, or rivaroxaban. From seven to nine, we can use it cautiously, dabigatran, abixaban, iduxaban, but it is not to be used, the rivaroxaban, for those patients with seven to nine points, a child buff score. For those patients with 10 to 15 child buff score, it is contraindicated totally for those patients with hepatopathy to use the NWAC. So it is important to calculate the child buff for the uh, uh, adjusting the use of uh, those drugs uh, in hepatopathy. What about if the bleeding occur while on NWAC? If it is mild bleeding, we can delay or discontinue the drug. We can reconsider concomitant medication. We reconsider choice of NOAC dosing. What if it is not life-threatening major bleeding? The major compression is important. The endoscopic hemostasis if gastrointestinal bleeding occurred, fluid replacement, RBCs, platelet substitution, especially if the platelet count less than 60, consider adjuvant tranexamic acid, and maintain adequate diuresis. As regard the antidote, I think the idrasozumab is the only antidote which is available for dabigatran. There is another antidote which is andexanet, andexanet, andexanet. It is for rivaroxaban, but it is not yet approved by the FDA. If there is a life-threatening bleeding, we can consider the prothrombin concentrates to uh, counteract this life-threatening bleeding for NOAC. What if the patient post-major gastrointestinal bleeding went to continue or restarting the NOAC after the gastrointestinal bleeding for those patients uh, in need for anticoagulation? If there is an undefiable site of bleeding, multiple angiodysplasias, no reversible treatable cause, bleeding during treatment interruption, chronic alcohol abuse, need for dual antiblitlet therapy after BCI, and if he is an older aged patient. We will do a net assessment in favor of withholding anticoagulation according to a multidisciplinary decision. We will discontinue, we will continue or reinitiate as early as possible after four to seven days if I have no of uh, uh, the factors favoring withholding uh, uh, from the above list. If we have something or factors which will enable us to restart, re, re, uh, restart the anticoagulation, we will consider the left atrial occlusion device. Another practical point for those patients who will be in need for doing intervention, either elective, coronary intervention of course, either elective or emergent. 
For those with elective PCI, we have to at, at, to stop the NOAC uh, for uh, 24 hours before the intervention. For those patients, especially those patients with coronary, multiple coronary artery disease affection, we will, it will be preferred to use bypass surgery if there will be on chronic oral anticoagulation. The procedural anticoagulation per local practice, the unfractionated heparin is preferred, pevlerodin, and we have to try to avoid GB2B3 inhibitors. And of course, the stent type, it is preferred to be the, uh, 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 the uh, third generation to avoid the long use duration for triple therapy, dual, anti dual antiplatelet and the oral anticoagulant. What about the emergent situation in acute coronary syndrome? For those patients with a STEMI, uh, we have to use the primary PCI pathway. SMUT will be much more better than fibrinolysis pathway. Why? Because there will be an increased risk of bleeding, especially that if we have no reference range for those anticoagulation, the bleeding risk will be high. Uh, so we have to use the primary uh, uh, PCI pathway and also we have to use especially the radial uh, axis to decrease the, uh, 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 the risk of bleeding. For those patients with nestomy, if it is urgent, the approach will be also primary intervention. If it is not urgent, we will delay the procedure till we can stop the NWAC and then we will uh, do the intervention. Uh, the approved also indications for NWAC, uh, there is a new indication here I'd like to uh, show you which is the use of uh, the rivaroxapan in a dose of 2.5 milligram BID for the, for the primary and secondary prevention for atherothrombotic events. This is a new indication in 2018 to use it in primary and sec in secondary prevention for atherothrombotic uh, events in both post ACS and in stable coronary artery disease. And I think this indication will be promising in the future for the uh, preventing the events. What about the acute ischemic stroke? For the acute ischemic stroke, uh, when to restart the anticoagulation, we will consider it one day after uh, 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 the attack of TIA, uh, three days if we have a mild neurological deficit, six to eight days if we have a moderate neurological deficit, and up to 12 to 14 days if we have a severe neurological deficit as it, adjusts, as it is uh, 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 shown in the CT or MRI within 24 hours from the event. Uh, the last thing, uh, uh, slide here, which I'd like to show you also, which is a practical slide, the post intracranial hemorrhage, when to restart the NOAC after an intracranial hemorrhage is a very challenging question. Here is uh, 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 the answer. If I have no factors from the above list, as we see here, the severe intracranial bleed, the multiple cerebral microbleds, uh, if the bleeding during the interruption of anticoagulation, if the bleed on adequacy or under uh, endorsed NOAC, if uncontrolled hypertension, chronic alcohol use, need for dual antiplatelet, if I have no of the above fact factors, and if I take the decision, multidisciplinary uh, decision, we can restart the NOAC after four eight to eight weeks. And I like this slide very much, which is by uh, Lucius Anius. It is in the year 4 PC. Uh, it is a good thing that we live in a time when medicine has made such a progress. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like uh, to say for all, we will continue this series of lecture on how to be beneficial for all. We will dive through different topics in different subspecialty in cardiology. أخيرا أنا بشكركو أتمنى أن المحاضرة تكون مفيدة. وأعدكو أن الكارديو جو سلسلة محاضرات كارديو جو تكون في موضوعات مختلفة، موضوعات مهمة، موضوعات تأخذ طن طابع العملية يستفيد منها صغار الأطباء 
القلب في ممارسات في ممارساتهم اليوميه ونشوفكم على خير ان شاء الله المحاضره القادمه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته